Hello, my name is Michael Kaler, and I am the lab manager at the Gym Diffraction Facility, which is a user facility located at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Individuals from UT, outside universities, national labs, and industry are all welcome to use our facilities. This is a standard configuration in the diffraction facility for powder diffraction. The left side is the incident beam side, and the right side is the diffracted beam side. In the middle sits the sample stage. Now this is where x-rays are generated, as indicated by the caution sticker. When this light is on, it means that the safety shutter is open, and x-rays are traveling through the optics. In this situation, it would not be safe to have the outer doors open as they are now. The shutter won't open if the outer doors are open though. Now let's take a closer look at the optics on the incident beam side. The first optic that the beam encounters is the solar slit. As we can see here, it is comprised of many plates parallel to each other. The distance between the plates determines the axial acceptance of the x-ray beam. We see here that it is 0.04 radians, so that is the axial acceptance. We do also have a 0 0.02 radian option. If you need to change that, it is located in the back left of the chamber. And typically, if you are just performing phase identification, I recommend the 0 0.04 radian slits because they give increased intensity so you get less noise more quickly. But if you want to perform refill refinements, I recommend the 0 0.02 radian slits because they give better peak shape and resolution but it does come at the expense of intensity, so you might have to run your experiment longer. If you need to change this optic, you can simply pull on it from there. I do ask that you handle it from this portion, not this portion, because you don't want to accidentally uh, touch those plates. And then to insert the correct one, just press until it stops moving. Next, we have the programmable divergence slit, which is also the prefix module for the incident beam side. I can't show you the divergence slit itself because it is contained within this enclosure, but I can tell you that it controls the height of the x-ray beam, which in turn determines the length of your sample that is irradiated. And length is this way, left to right. So a smaller slit means that you have less sample that is irradiated left to right. Next, we have the mask, shown here, which controls the width of the sample that is irradiated. Width is defined as the direction from the front of the chamber to the back. If you need to change the mask, we have this small tool located in the bottom of the chamber. All you need to do is insert the tool into the small hole at the top of the mask. I like to place my thumb here in order to prevent the mask from flying out, and then simply lift the mask out. When you do this, please don't rest your hand on the sample stage and press down on it. We can see right here that the mask is the 10 mask. And if you need to insert the mask, just simply press down until it rests in place. Sometimes it takes a little force, but that's okay. If you do need to change the mask, our other masks are located in a small plastic container near the computer and you should see that in the top left portion of your screen. Finally, we have the anti-scatter slit shown here, and this reduces background due to x-rays scattering off the air. Now this needs to equal two times the divergence slit. So if the divergence slit is one-fourth of a degree, this should be one-half of a degree. If you need to change it, you can simply remove it, we see right here that it is one half of a degree. If you need a different size, they are also located in that small plastic bin, which you should see on the top left of your screen. And if you need to put a new one in, simply insert it all the way, and then pull back until you feel and hear the click. Now that is everything on the incident beam side. We have the solar slits back here, which you can't see right now. We have the programmable divergence slit, the mask, and the anti-scatter slit. Next we have the sample stage, which is where your sample will sit during the experiment. 
It is called the reflection transmission spinner stage, and that is pretty self-explanatory. We can perform reflection experiments, transmission experiments, and it will also spin your sample to bring more crystallites into the x-ray beam. Now let's look at the diffracted beam side. The first optic that the beam encounters is the programmable anti-scatter slit, and this is also the prefix module for this side. And the programmable anti-scatter slit does the same thing that the anti-scatter slit does on the incident side. It cuts down on background due to scattering from air. But the size of this programmable anti-scatter slit needs to equal the programmable divergence slit from the other side. So if the programmable divergence slit equals 1 fourth, then the anti-scatter slit on the incident side needs to equal 1 half, and this should equal 1 fourth. Next, we have another solar slit. This one the computer calls large because it is bigger in this direction. But we'll just make sure that the numbers match. So we had 04 on the other side, so we want 04 on this side. If you need to change it, if you need the O2 instead, it should be in the back right of the chamber. Here we have the nickel filter. You can see nickel down there by my thumb. And what this does is that it absorbs K beta radiation. So ideally we would like a monochromatic x-ray beam, but we really have about three wavelengths, K alpha 1, K alpha 2, and K beta. And each one of those will produce its own set of peaks. So if you don't have this nickel filter in there, you will see extra peaks in the diffraction pattern. But we like to include this to get rid of that extra wavelength. And finally, we have the detector shown here. It's a pixel. And this detector is able to collect over 3.3 degrees of 2 theta all at once in a single position. So it allows for much quicker data collection with less noise. And that comprises all of the optics and the different parts of the standard powder diffraction setup. So after you have checked the hardware to make sure that it matches what you want it to be, you will want to go to the computer and go to data collector, double click, and then you will log in with the username and password that you will get after you complete training. The first thing we need to do is connect the computer to the hardware, to the Empyrean. So we want to do instrument, connect. If you will recall, the sample stage had reflection, transmission, spinner labeled on the bottom of it. So this is the one we want. So we'll say OK. This window just tells you some of the hardware settings that the computer thinks is correct. Let's say OK for now because we will correct that here in a little bit. And now we see three main tabs. Instrument settings, incident beam optics, and diffracted beam optics. Now let's go through these one by one. Instrument settings, if we double click anything, we get this window, and we see three tabs. Position, we don't really use for this type of experiment. Let's skip over to x-ray. We see that for the generator, the tension is 45 kilovolts, and the current is 20 milliamps. This is good for standby settings if no one is using the instrument, but if you want to perform an experiment, we need to change this to 40 milliamps. We can say apply. You'll just have to wait a moment for it to ramp up to 40 milliamps. We can then come over here to sample stage and we can see that there is a check mark next to lift up. If we uncheck it and then say apply, we will see the sample stage drop down so that we can put our sample inside. So I will unlock the doors and go do that now.
We can now come back and put a check mark next to lift up and say OK. And now we are done with the instrument settings tab. Let's move on to the incident beam optics. So here, and then in the diffracted beam optics, we use these two tabs to tell the computer what hardware we have installed on the Empyrean. So let's start with incident beam optics. We'll double click anything inside. I like radius. And now we see a bunch of tabs and we need to make sure that all of these are correct. For the prefix module for the incident beam, which is remember the left hand side of the chamber, we have the programmable divergence slit. The divergence slit that we wanted was fixed 1 4th degree. The anti-scatter slit is fixed 1 half. The mask is 10 millimeter. Now we also have this 10 millimeter, but that is for a different prefix module, so we want to choose this one. And you do not need to change the distance. We didn't talk about a mirror, so we don't use one for this type of experiment, so we will say none. Beam knife, also none. Let me take a minute to point out these tabs. If you click the top row, it becomes the bottom row. So when I clicked beam knife, it came down. Just be aware of that. Solar slit. This says that it is the O2 radian, but we actually have the O4 radian, so we will change that. Filter. We have a filter, but it is on the other side. So for this side, the type is none. Beam attenuator, none. Monochrometer, also none. Let's say OK. This window just says, or it tells us to make the changes that we announced in here. We need to take out the O2 solar slit and insert the O4. We did that, so we can say OK. We can then come over here to Diffracted Beam Optics, double click. That prefix module is the Detector plus Programmable Anti-Scatter Slit, or PASS. Note that we also have FAS. This is a fixed anti-scatter slit, and this is to be used with our high temperature in situ measurements. So for the experiment we have set up for now, it should be PASS. Anti-scatter slit should match the divergent slit from the other side, so it is one-fourth. No receiving slit. The filter is a beta filter nickel. There is another nickel filter that is for a mirror that we are not using right now. Beam attenuator, none. Detector is a scanning line detector 1D. It is 3.3482 degrees. Collimator none, solar slit is the large O4 radian, and mask is none. We have a mask on the other side, but not this side. So we'll say OK. We made this change, so we can say OK. And now you can either set up a program, or if you already have a program that you want to run, you can just run it, but for this first time, I will show you how to make a new program. You can click this button. We want an absolute scan. Say OK. Most of this should be correct for you, and before I go into setting up the start angle, end angle, that sort of thing, let's look at the settings button. Here we can tell the program if we want the sample to spin, which is great because that puts more crystallites into the x-ray beam. So I will typically spin powdered samples either two or four seconds. And next I will put, or I will set this up to match the settings that we put in incident beam optics and diffracted beam optics over here. And what this does is that once the program runs, it will compare these settings to these settings to make sure that they match. If they don't, it will warn you and give you a chance to make the correction. This is great for beginner users as it provides a safety net, but if you are more of an advanced user, this is not necessary. You can just leave these settings to actual and it will take whatever settings you put over here. 
So we will go through these a little bit more quickly than we did this just a few minutes ago. So incident beam path prefix module is the programmable divergence slit. We want it to be fixed at one fourth of a degree. The filter, there is none on the incident side. Solar slit is the O4. Beam attenuator, none. Mask is that 10 millimeter. Anti-scatter slit, one half. Beam knife, none. Mirror, none. Monochrometer, none. For the diffracted beam pass, our prefix module was pass. We want that to be fixed and one fourth. Filter is the beta filter nickel. Solar slit is the large O4. Detector, scanning line detector 1D. Beam attenuator none, collimator none, mask none, and receiving slit none. Let me just point out that assuming your future experiments use the same optics as your first experiment, you only have to change these settings when you first make your program. If your future experiments use different optics, then you will need to change these settings to match. So let's say OK. So here we see our start angle and end angle. Now if you know what you want to use here, then that is great. You can go ahead and enter. But if you're not sure, I recommend starting at 5 or 10 degrees for a start angle and end angle 90 degrees. Similar with the step size, if you know what you need to use here, go ahead and enter it. But if you don't, I like to try 0 0.026 to start. And you will notice that it has a very specific number. You don't have to remember this number. You can just put in 0 0.02 and it will correct it. And then time per step, I like to do about 50 seconds. And that gets me about an 11 minute experiment. I will do these settings to start, and then I will do this quick scan, look at the results, and see how it is that I need to change it in order to improve the diffraction pattern. So we can go File, Save As. I'll just choose this YouTube folder, and go to Programs. We see here, this is a program that I made before. This is how I typically like to name my programs. I say a little bit about the hardware with the prefix modules, so PDS on the incident side, and then pass on the diffracted side. 5 to 90 degrees, 0 0.026 degree step size. I believe this time I did 50 seconds, so we'll change this and it's an 11 minute scan. This way you know what's in the program without actually having to open it. So I will say save. And now we can measure the program by going measure, program, browse. I will go to my YouTube folder, programs. It's this 50 second program. Then we want to click on this folder icon and tell it where to save it and what file name to give it. We'll do YouTube, data, and I'll just name this something like YouTube example silicon. I'll hit enter, and now you could put in more information such as ID, uh, name, who prepared it, but I typically just leave that blank and say OK. At this point, if the program settings don't match these settings, it will warn us. There we go, it has started.
Now I will go ahead and speed this up so that we can see what the diffraction pattern looks like after it's done, and we will go from there. So our experiment has completed. The peaks look very nice. For basic phase ID, this is perfectly acceptable. They are very sharp peaks, low noise. If you were wanting to perform Riedfeld refinement or get more information about the crystallite size or microstrain from the peak breadth, you would want to come in here, left click and zoom in on the peak. Zoom in a little bit more. Here we see some peak asymmetry that is likely caused by the fact that we used 0.04 radian solar slits. If we used 0.02 radian, that asymmetry would decrease. But let's also check to make sure that our step size from the program, the 0 0.026 degrees, was a good value. If we right click and choose axes, we can choose show markers, close, and then if we right click peak mode, it shows us where the full width half maximum is. And we see that we only have three data points above that full width half maximum. Now for a well-defined peak, we would want eight to 12 data points above the full width half maximum. So for refinements and crystallite size and micro strain determination, that step size really isn't good enough. Personally, I would probably go back and change the program so that it was 0 0.006. That would make the program much longer, about 45 minutes. We might be able to change that to 25 seconds in order to save some time, but it will be a little bit noisier. But we would just have to run it and see how it looks. But this is how I determine how to, um, or what step size would be best. Now if we decided that just phase ID is all we wanted and that was good enough, and we wanted to run another sample, we would just come over to instrument settings, double click, uncheck lift up, say apply, take our previous sample out, put our new sample in, lift up, and OK. And then we would just go through and do the same measure, program, browse, find the program, and then tell it where to save and what to save as. I won't do that now because I'm not going to run it again, but you see how quickly you can change from one sample to the next. The real time consuming part is just the first time you come in for the day, checking to make sure that the hardware and software match what you want them to be. Now whenever you are done for the day, if no one has the instrument reserved right after you, you would just want to uncheck that, apply, take your sample out, and then come over here to x-ray, change that back to 20, say OK. And then instrument, disconnect, OK. And then close the software. Here, they're just asking if I want to save the program settings that I changed. I'll say no. And then that is it. If you would like more information about the diffraction facility, please visit our website. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you, and I hope you have a great day.